my pleasure to um, introduce to you Dr. Stephanie Crowley. She's an associate professor in the Department of Behavioral Sciences at Rush University Medical Center. She earned her bachelor's degree in psychology from the College of the Holy Cross at Wor Wor Worcester, Massachusetts in 2000, and her doctorate in experimental psychology from Brown University. That was in 2009. Dr. Crowley's broad research interest is sleep, weight behavior, and the approximate 24-hour circadian clock. Over the past 12 years, her research has focused on changes to sleep and the circadian timing system during adolescence. Dr. Crowley's work has been supported by the NIH since she was in graduate school when she received a pre-doctoral training grant from the NIH of Mental Health. Dr. Crowley is the lead investigator of two large projects funded by the National Heart, Lung, and Blood Institutes. Dr. Crowley has authored or co-authored 30 publications and invited book, chap invited book chapters and has served as a grant, grant reviewer for NIH, NSF, and NASA. Dr. Crowley has been active in service both locally and in national sleep organizations, but her most fun moments come when she gets the opportunities to speak to students in local classrooms about the science of sleep and the importance of healthy sleep. So without further ado, please help me welcome Dr. Stephanie Crowley. Well, thank you so much for inviting me today. Um, again, my name is Stephanie Crowley. I'm from Rush University. And first I want to congratulate Barrington for approaching this issue of school start time because, as you all know, it is a complicated issue um, with a lot of differing opinions, all valid differing opinions. Um, but I do just want to emphasize that it has been done before. There are a number of school systems that have changed their school start times to be later, and we've seen great success as a result. So it is doable. You just have to keep plugging away at it and keep talking to each other and negotiating um, your opinions. So my job tonight is to tell you about, or to answer the question, does the science su support later school start times? The short answer is yes. But I'm going to go through some of the scientific evidence that we have and we've been collecting for over 30 years, if you can believe it. Um, so we'll, we'll go through some of that tonight. Now, over the last couple of years, you've probably seen a lot of press about this school start time issue. So in U.S. News and World Report, their headline was, screwed by the bell. Thanks to schools, teens aren't sleeping enough. That's pretty uh, blunt. Uh, and also the Atlantic, why schools, why schools should start later in the mornings. And many other, um, many other, other articles on this same issue over the last year. So what has prompted this great increase in the press? Well, in 2014, there was a white paper, or a policy statement, by the Ameri American Academy of Pediatrics that, among other things, was um, proposing that middle and high schools should aim for a start time of no earlier than 8.30 a.m. And this policy, policy statement was really prompted by an overwhelming evidence that adolescents are not getting enough sleep. And we've known this. Again, for about 30 years. And 2014, just two years ago, was when this policy statement came out. <clears throat> so to start, um, I think everybody should kind of get a sense of what we think, or how much sleep we think adolescents need. Okay, so this is the, um, the most recent recommendations for sleep duration that came out from the National Sleep Foundation and was published by Hershkowitz and colleagues in 2015. So this is just showing that the sleep duration range here is in the blue, so 14 to 17, 12, 12 to 15, and so on. You can see that sleep need decreases across the lifespan. So I'd like to start with this because if there's any adults in the room that um, don't get more than seven hours, seven to eight hours, you might also be sleep deprived, so that's a stuff. Public service announcement. Um, but we're really going to focus on these preschoolers, school age, and high schoolers. So 
We think that about three to five year olds need between 10 and 13 hours of sleep. And I should say that these recommendations came from a lot of sleep scientists and physicians that kind of came together to put together these recommendations. So it's not just Joe Schmall off the street. We think that school age children, so between six and 13 years old, they need about nine to 11 hours of sleep. And 14 to 17 year olds, so your high school students, they need about eight to 10 hours of sleep. And we keep these ranges because everybody is different. I might need nine hours of sleep, you might need eight hours of sleep. We're all very different in how much sleep we actually need. So that's why we provide these ranges. Now despite these recommendations of sleep need, we find that sleep duration decreases drastically as kids get older. So these data are from the Sleep in America poll from 2004 and 2006. And this is sleep duration here on the y-axis and school grade on the x-axis. And you can see that self-reported sleep duration short shortens with age. So from third grade to 12th grade, we see this drastic reduction in self-reported sleep duration. And I'm sure you've seen this in your own children as well. Now, if we just picked the minimum amount that we think kids need, so in grade school, we think the minimum amount they need is nine hours. And in high school, we think the minimum amount is eight hours. We can see that just starting in middle school, so around the sixth grade, we see that their self-reported sleep times, this insufficient, this pattern of insufficient sleep starts to emerge during the middle school years. Now, um, we also know from a number of studies that about 70% or seven out of 10 adolescents get less than seven hours of sleep on school night, per night, which is characterized as, or which would be defined as insufficient sleep. So, what are the factors that contribute to this change in sleep behavior? that we've seen. Well, there's a lot of data, again, gathered over the last 30 years or so, um, that uh, we know that there is a biological change during puberty. So first we need to understand how sleep and wake is controlled or regulated. And there are two main body systems that regulate sleep. The first is this sleep pressure system. And you can kind of think about the sleep pressure system as a balance. So the longer that you're asleep, the more you want to wake up. The more that you're, aw you're awake, the more you want to sleep. So it's kind of this balance, this homeostasis that we see in, in sleep. We call that homeostatic sleep pressure, or process S it's sometimes called. And you can also think about it as like kind of a bean counter in your brain. So it kind of keeps track of how long you've been awake, or how long you've been asleep. We kind of balance that out. The other system is the circadian, or 24-hour biological clock. So you might have heard about this biological clock, this 24-hour clock. And the circadian system actually controls a number of different things in your physiology. And one of the things that it controls is the timing of sleep and wake. It also controls when you should eat and when you shouldn't eat. Um, but for our purposes, we'll just focus on sleep timing. So these are the two systems that regulate when we want to be asleep, or when we should be asleep, and when we should be awake. Well, how do these systems change during puberty? Well, we know that during puberty, that balance system, that sleep pressure system, the balance is a little bit different, or changes a little bit during puberty. We think that might be a result of cortical synaptic pruning, which basically just means that these synapses in adolescents' brains will start to be pruned. And um, what happens is that pressure for sleep across the day, it starts to build a little bit more slowly in older, more mature adolescents compared to younger, less mature adolescents. So what does that mean? Well, it means that an older adolescent can actually stay awake a little bit later into the evening. So that pressure for sleep isn't so big at the end of the end of the day compared to, say, their little sister in second grade. Another thing that happens 
is that that circadian clock, that internal mechanism that regulates the timing of sleep and wake, it runs a little bit later in older adolescents compared to younger adolescents. So that clock, sig that the clock that signals that um, that cue for sleep is actually later in older adolescents compared to younger adolescents. And I'll show you some data on that. So this is a study that was done by Dr. Chris Gadnett Brown, who was my PhD mentor and really the pioneer in adolescent sleep and circadian rhythms. Uh, and she's been doing this for 30 plus years. And what she did is she kept adolescents at different puberty stages in controlled conditions. And then she measured this hormone called melatonin. And melatonin is the hormone of darkness. It kind of cues your brain to know when to sleep. And it turns out that that melatonin onset time, so when that hormone starts to be squirted out in the brain from the pineal gland, uh, it cues sleep, that that cue is earlier in, uh, in early puberty, pre or early puberty, so that's what puberty stage one would be, compared to post-puberty. So what we call Tanner stage five is post-puberty. Um, so we can see that this biological cue is actually getting later as kids are getting more mature. And it turns out that the same thing happens in other mammals. So it's just not humans. Um, this circadian clock shifts later during puberty, and these cute little things called dagoos, which are cousins to chinchillas, they're actually very, very cute. I worked with them for a little bit. Um, rhesus monkeys, also we see this phase delay or the shift later of the clock. Lab rats, lab mice, and also the fat sand rat. You see this, this pattern of delayed rhythms. So what does this mean for behavior? Well, this is another study done by Dr. Dan Taylor, um, who is down in Texas now. And what he did was he had prepubertal adolescents, so those are the younger adolescents, and, and postpubertal adolescents into the lab. And he did this test to determine how long it takes an adolescent to fall asleep. It's called the multiple sleep latency test. That's not important. But if you can fall, if you don't fall asleep, um, if it takes you a long time to fall asleep, and this is a 20 minute test, that's a good indication physiologically that you're pretty alert. And if you fall asleep right away, like under five minutes, you're pathological sleepy. You're very, very sleepy. Note to self. If you fall asleep really, really fast, that might mean that you're pathologically sleepy. <clears throat> Again, public service announcement. Um, so if you fall asleep really fast, that means that you're pretty tired. Now you can see I'm highlighting this part here because it, 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 they did these tests across the day from 10.30 in the morning, um, at 2.30 in the afternoon, 6.30, all the way to 6.30 the next day. And what they found was at about 10.30, you can see that the post-pubertal older adolescent took a lot longer to fall asleep, more than 15 minutes, compared to the prepubertal adolescent. And this happened again at about 12.30 a.m., so around midnight. So around the time of bedtime, these older, more mature adolescents are taking much longer to fall asleep, which is a good indication that they're much more alert than, our, than their prepubertal peers, um, than their little brothers or sisters. Now, if an adolescent is around 10.30 or 11, and they're wide awake, what do you think they're going to do? Grab their phone, right? <laughs> so we have the fun factors. And these types of things do impact bedtime. So you have the biology kind of interacting with the environment factors as well. So you have cell phones, and a lot of the um, social interactions are happening on social media now, right? So Instagram, Facebook. Actually, they don't use Facebook anymore, right? That's just for the old people, apparently. <laughs> Um, binging on Netflix. Oh, just one more episode of Pretty Little Liars. Um, video games. If I'm alert, why don't I just stay up and play video games, right? But there's also family time. So, of course, you want to spend some time with your kids, however old they are. 
they might not want to spend much time with you, but you want to spend time with your, your kids. Um, and we have sports practices after school, and even games later into the night. So that can also kind of push other things off, like, oh wait, homework. <laughs> That's another thing that has to happen in the evening, right? So these environmental factors, all these things that they have to do after school, um, they're doing before bed, but they're able to do this before bed because of their biology. They're feeling more alert. Um, and I'm not saying that this is what pushes bedtimes later, but it can contribute. Um, a lot of it is biological. So we see across time, again, these are data from the Sleep in, the Sleep in America poll, and we can see that self-reported bedtimes get much later at age. So in third grade, it's around 9 p.m., but by the high school years, we see that bedtimes are after 10 o'clock, and by senior year, um, closer to 11 or midnight. There's actually one study that shows um, that uh, adolescents who are in 12th grade were going, going to bed closer to midnight or 1 a.m. But even though bedtimes are getting later because of that biological push to move later, wake-up times are staying the same or getting earlier. So we see in third grade that self-reported bedtimes around 7 o'clock, and then as we transition into middle school, they, um, they get a little bit earlier, and into high school they stay early. So I wanted to share with you a study that we did, um, we published in 2014, where we studied and followed kids for two and a half years. So this is a longitudinal study. We, we looked at the same child over um, two and a half years. So we studied a younger group and an older group, so the younger group was 9 or 10 years old when we started, and the older group was 15 or 16 years old when we started. And we followed them over, as I said, two and a half years. So by the end, the younger group was 11 and a half to 13 years, and the older group was 17 and a half to 19 years. And what we had them do was come and visit the lab every six months so we could look at their sleep patterns. So we wanted to track what actually happens to one individual over time. We did this during the school year, and they could just keep their normal schedule. So we said, just keep your normal school week schedule. We just want to see what you do out in the wild. And we measured their sleep with an actigraph, which is pictured here. Um, it's kind of like a Fitbit or a Java. If you measure your sleep with your Fitbit, it's kind of like that. It just measures activity. Uh, we also asked them to keep a sleep diary every day, and they called the lab and left messages in the morning and then when they went to bed. So that's how we track their sleep. So these are the data from their actigraph, their objective measures of sleep. This is their fall asleep time, according to their actigraph, on weekdays. And, and in high school, the high school age kids, they stay pretty early, so it's 6.30. And we see this huge increase. Why were those kids getting up so late? They weren't in high school anymore. <laughs> So we really found that wake time does coincide with school start times, and that's what these diamonds are, um, are showing. That's their school start times as they got a little bit earlier. They woke up earlier. Once they arrived high school, they were able to sleep when their body was telling them to sleep, which was a little bit later. So we have this situation where we have these biological factors that contribute to late bedtimes, and again, having other stuff that can displace sleep, like cell phones, tablets, TV, and all that stuff. Um, and then we have these early school start times that are forcing students to wake up too early uh, for their biological clock. And so there's a squeeze on their sleep time, their sleep opportunity. And that's why we're often seeing this squeeze on sleep times during uh, the school week and why we see so many adolescents, especially in high school, getting less than seven hours of sleep. Like 70% of adolescents are getting less than seven hours of sleep. So you might say, oh, my daughter's fine. She's not sleepy, she's fine. I did this when I was in high school, right? Well, I'll give you some signs of insufficient sleep so you can go home and kind of see whether your child might be um, sleep deprived. So one sign is that they need to be awakened in the morning. 
by an alarm clock by mom and dad. Actually, one, I had an adolescent report that the way he wakes up is by dad putting the dog on the bed. So, an interesting alarm clock, probably works. Um, so if you need to be awakened in the morning, you're probably waking at the wrong time for your body, or you're sleep deprived. If you sleep more than two hours on the weekends or vacations than you do on school or work days, um, that's another indication of insufficient sleep. And I think a lot of people do this, they oversleep. Remember, there's this sleep pressure system. If we're restricting our sleep during the week, this is a biological need, so we rebound on the weekends. We sleep more on the weekends because this is such an important biological need. It's like eating. If you're hungry, you eat. If you're tired, you sleep. Um, and then another sign of insufficient sleep is that you see students or um, your children falling asleep at inappropriate times, during class, in a car, on an airplane. You know how uncomfortable those airplane seats are? Yet so many people can fall asleep. That is a sleep deprived nation, indeed. Okay, so why do we care about sleep? Why do we care about this issue of insufficient sleep? Well, we know that insufficient sleep, or too short sleep, is associated with an increased risk for depression, anxiety, and thoughts of suicide in adolescents. We also know that insufficient sleep is associated with behavior problems. So increased aggressive behaviors, increased hyperactivity, um, poor impulse control, so uh, making decisions or saying something foolish without really meaning to. So you can't really control your behaviors. No frontal lobe inhibition there. We also know that insufficient sleep is associated with risk-taking behaviors. So that includes substance use like alcohol, marijuana, nicotine. It's also associated with more sexual behaviors, risky sexual behaviors, casual sex, and so on. We also know that it's associated with deviant behavior. And it's, it's associated with increased car accidents. So if you think about your older adolescents, 16, 17, who just got their license, this is a big concern. And <clears throat> these data are pretty old, but um, I think still provides the point. Um, 100,000 crashes each year are caused by sleepy drivers. And if you are awake for 18 hours and you get behind a wheel, that's the equivalent of being drunk. Being drunk and getting behind the wheel. So we know how bad that is. But a lot of people don't really realize how bad drowsy driving is. Um, so this was an analysis done by Dr. Alan Pack, and what he found was that the number of accidents, um, and this is age down here on the bottom, that 50% of these fall asleep crashes were occurring in people between 16 and 25. And that includes our new drivers, 16 and 17 year olds. What he also found was that across the day, so this is the number of crashes again across 24 hours, and he found that the peak of crashes was happening in the early morning, around 7 a.m. on the way to school. So if you think about it, we have these new drivers who are not very um, experienced. They might, they might be very good, but not experienced. If they're waking up the wrong circadian time, if they're sleep deprived, there's certainly an increased risk of driving to school and getting in a car accident. Other consequences of insufficient sleep are neurocognitive deficits. What does that mean? Well, you're not very attentive. You can't pay attention very well while they're in class. Um, and you also can't learn and you don't have a very good memory. So a lot of data in the last 10 years or so has come out showing that sleep can actually enhance your memory and enhance something that you've learned the day before. Um, and there are a number of studies in animals and in humans showing that sleep enhances learning. Um, so co other consequences of insufficient sleep is reduction in executive functioning. Well, what does that work mean? Um, so that means like planning, decision making, um, and 
our adolescents are making some pretty big decisions, um, especially in the high school. So decision making is not um, as good without sleep. And a study by Dr. Gaines Malone back in the early 2000s showed that uh, he actually asked teachers to rate students after they were sleep deprived. So I think they were getting about five or six hours of sleep per night for about a week. And what the teacher said was the, qu the quality of work went down, the percent of work completed went down, and they had a lot of difficulty recalling the material that was done. So knowing all that, it's not surprising that with too little sleep, the, great, the academic grades are also going to suffer. And there are a number of studies showing that short sleep is associated, even less than eight hours, is associated with um, poor grades. So, and finally, moving from the brain to the body, there was a seminal study done in 1999 by Ed Van Quarter down in uh, the University of Chicago. And what she did, this was an adult, but what she did was she put a lean, healthy men, um, healthy, very healthy, and uh, put them on five hours of sleep for about a week. After that week, all of those men were pre-diabetic. And when that study came out, the sleep field thought, oh my gosh, we gotta move from the brain to the body. Because we know that insufficient sleep can lead to physiological changes in the body. In adolescence, we know that insufficient sleep is associated with weight gain. Um, so it's associated with increased caloric intake, increased consumption of fats and carbs, and also fast food. And there's also a study showing that insufficient sleep is associated with um, craving or the appeal of sweets and desserts. Insufficient sleep in adolescence is also associated with high cholesterol and high blood pressure. And these types of things, starting in adolescence, you can believe it, could down the road in adulthood lead to things like type 2 diabetes and other cardiometabolic risks. So it's not just the brain, it's also the body. Now, what does an adolescent do when they're sleepy during the day? That's the number one drug we all gravitate towards. Caffeine, coffee, Starbucks. <laughs> um, so if you don't get enough sleep, you gravitate towards caffeine. And if you're having caffeine later in the day, that can disrupt your sleep. You might not think it does. Oh no, coffee after dinner, it's fine. It does nothing to me. It actually suppresses your REM sleep. So it does affect your sleep, and it can disrupt your sleep. Um, and also, another thing that I've noticed over the over the years is that um, adolescents like to come home from school and take a nap. They're just exhausted and I just need to take a nap. That's another sign of sleep deprivation. Um, but what happens is, remember this balancing system, the sleep pressure system that we have. If they take a nap for two hours after school, we're reducing that pressure for sleep. And then when bedtime comes along, they can't fall asleep. So taking a long nap after school can actually disrupt sleep that next night. And so we have this vicious cycle of not getting enough sleep, having some more caffeine or a prophylactic nap, and then disrupting sleep again, going back to the caffeine, and so on. So we have to break that vicious cycle somehow. And the best way to do that is to try and get enough sleep during the day so you don't, sorry, get enough sleep at night so that you don't have to rely on these crutches of caffeine and midday naps for too long. I'm not saying naps are bad, naps are good, um, but naps are way too long, um, I would say more than 30 minutes or so, can disrupt sleep. So, I've shown you some of the data. Um, I don't have time to show you all of the data. But based on a lot of this data that has been accumulated, there has been a huge call for reform. So the U.S. Department of Education Secretary, Arja Duncan, tweeted, who great that he tweets, um, common sense to improve student achievement that too few have implemented. Let teens sleep more, start school later. And there has been school start time legislation drafted um, or proposed at the state and the federal level, and these states in, in green, um, but you can see that there's a lot of gray states here too, so we still have a lot of work ahead of us, but um, there has been a big call, and um, we do have a lot of work ahead. 
ahead of us. So, now I want to move on to talk about some of the, some of the school systems that have changed their school start times and some of the results that they found from this change. Um, so we know from multiple studies um, that there is a benefit of later school start times, including students getting more than eight hours of sleep per night, so increasing sleep duration. So you have a decrease in the amount of depression or depressed mood. And this is particularly for girls. Um, we often see a lot more depressed mood in girls with insufficient sleep. Less caffeine use, so trying to break that cycle of insufficient sleep and disrupted sleep. Better academic outcomes. Better attendance rates. Higher graduation rates. Reduced tardiness. And fewer car crashes. So I'm going to go through a few of these examples, um, but they are in the literature. There are a number of schools that have done this, as I said before. So it is doable. <clears throat> so in Fayette County, Kentucky, um, they changed their high school from 7.30 a.m. to 8.30 a.m. And what they found was an increase in total sleep time. Um, so here in this graph, here's hours of sleep, and the black bar is before the change, and the white bar is after the change. You see the ninth grade, you see this bump in total sleep time in all the grades, particularly in the seniors. Maybe they had senioritis, so they thought that they could sleep a little bit more, but um, the before and after is pretty striking. <clears throat> and the percent of students that were getting eight hours or more went from 36% to 50%. So we see a lot more of these um, students getting more sleep. These, um, Danner and Phillips also looked at the, um, the number of motor vehicle crashes at the county level, and they found that, uh, so this is crashes per 1,000 teen drivers, and they found that at the county level, the number of crashes actually decreased after the change, whereas at the state level, it actually increased by about 7%. <clears throat> In Teton County, Wyoming, they started their schools 80 minutes later. So they went from 7.35 a.m. to 8.55 a.m. And after the change, they saw a sleep duration increase by 42 minutes. So from 7.5 hours to 8.2 hours. And 66.2% of students were sleeping eight or more hours. Tardies decreased, the number of tardies decreased from 6.7 to 3.3. And they also saw an increase in their grade point average. And this is just one, one study out of a lot of studies that show these multiple benefits. And if anybody's interested, this Wallstrom um, paper here from 2014 shows, I think, eight different schools, um, the outcomes from eight different schools. This is just one that I'm showing you. OK, so what about sports? In my experience, this has been one of the biggest oppositions of sports because when do our kids practice after school and how the other surrounding towns will not have the same practice or game time. So what do we do to sports? Well, it turns out that Wilton, Connecticut changed their start times with a strong opposition from coaches, which is understandable. And the next year they had the best season winning several state championships. The Stanford, bas the Stanford basketball team, they actually tried this little experiment where they increased their sleep duration for a night to 10 hours in bed. So their sleep opportunity was increased. We think they probably slept most of that. Um, but they found that they sprinted faster by 0.7 seconds on average. Their free throws were 9% more accurate. And they also reported improved mood and, de and decreased fatigue. Stanford swimmers. So I know swimming is a big um, sport here in Barrington. Um, so Stanford decided, okay, just for six or seven weeks, let's just have our, our swimmers um, sleep for 10 hours a night, or have the opportunity to sleep for 10 hours a night. And what they found afterwards was that their 15 meter sprint was 0.51 <laughs> seconds faster on average. They reacted 0.15 seconds quicker off the blocks 
and they improve turn time by 0 0.10 seconds. Okay, so what does this really mean in the grand scheme of things? Well, let's just point out that Michael Phelps won a gold medal by 0 0.01 seconds. So this is the difference between winning first place and not. The other question that I often get is, well, won't my kid just kind of go to bed later if we're going to start school later? Overwhelmingly, across studies, no. Adolescents actually, the students actually go to bed at the same time and they just wake up later. Um, so that's how they're increasing their sleep duration. However, I think rules still can help at home. So <clears throat> we do see this across studies, but to kind of maintain that uh, bedtime at, um, at an appropriate bedtime, I think house rules couldn't hurt. Um, I know this is a little difficult for the 16, 17 year olds setting a bedtime, well, well, I can't do that. Um, but if you can negotiate a reasonable bedtime to get sufficient sleep and stick to that bedtime, that will really help. We know that parents at bedtimes decrease suicidal ideation and depression. Setting your kid's bedtime is very, very important. And sticking to that bedtime is very, very important. The other thing you might want to consider is a media curfew. So remember all those environmental factors I was talking about that kind of can contribute to later bedtimes? Maybe just an hour, or half an hour before bed, put cell phones, <coughs> tablets, um, game, stations, TVs, turn all those off and do something a little bit more relaxing. So whether that's oh, reading a book <laughs> or um, uh, doing something a little bit more boring, reading a history book. My, my husband's a history teacher, so I can say that. There are any history teachers in the audience. Um, <clears throat> but try to have a media curfew and do not put cell phones in your bedrooms. There's this kind of epidemic where Adolescents or teenagers will get a text in the middle of the night and actually answer it in the middle of the night. And it's actually turning into a big problem. Um, and it's almost similar to a sleep disorder called sleep apnea, where they're waking up a lot during the night to answer texts. So not only are they answering it, but they're getting this blast of blue light into their eyes. It's just very, very alerting. So sleep disruption um, is very, Sleep can be disrupted by just having a cell phone in, in your teen's bedroom. Okay, and then finally I was asked to kind of address this issue of, element, of the elementary school. So I know that here in Barrington there's um, a proposal to start the elementary schools earlier. Um, I think some of that is up here and I think that'll be addressed a little bit later. Um, <clears throat> I'm not going to get into the specifics, but um, this idea of flipping the elementary and the middle or high schools, it has been done before. Um, so some school systems have shifted all the schools later, and some have flipped the younger kids with the older kids. Unfortunately, there's very little data on the outcomes of that flip. We don't really know what happens to the elementary schools. So unfortunately, I can't really speak a lot to the outcomes. But I do have some things to consider. One is that elementary school students, they need more sleep than high school students. Remember that sleep need chart that I showed you in the beginning. So in kindergarten, we recommend 10 to 13 hours of sleep for those five-year-olds, four to five-year-olds. In grades one through five, remember they need about nine to 11 hours of sleep. Same, same thing for middle school students. In high school, we think that they need more like eight to 10 hours. So the lower kids, they do need a little bit more sleep. So Nissen was very um, generous with um, some of the data that he, that he and others have collected here in Barrington. Um, the current sleep times for your elementary school students um, is about 9 o'clock, so 8.55 p.m. to 7.10 a.m. So that's about 10 hours of sleep. Good on you, elementary school kids. You're getting enough sleep. So what we want to do is not change that 10 hour sleep, right? We want to make sure that your kids are still getting enough sleep um, and that we're not shifting the school start times too early, but that inhibits them from getting enough sleep because that would not, that's not the point. 
So school, uh, the bus usually on average comes at about 8.15 currently, but again, there's this about 30 minutes, um, plus or minus 15 minutes. So between 8 and 8.30 is when the bus comes and school starts at 9. So I'm gonna give you a few scenarios and these do not match up with the scenarios here at, at all. This is just kind of out of my own head. Um, <clears throat> just something to think about. Oh, and I put this little block of blue here to indicate that the pre-K and kindergartners will probably need a little bit more sleep, so maybe um, closer to 11. So they would probably need to go to bed by about eight and seven, nine. Okay, so if we started school at 8.30 for the elementary school, um, that would mean that the buses would probably have to come around 7.30 um, or eight o'clock. 7.30 to 8 o'clock, average of 7.45. Now I'm assuming it's um, about 45 minute morning prep. I think that's reasonable for an elementary school child to get out. Okay, I kind of was estimating that. Um, and say a 45 minute bus ride. So that's just from the average of the school start time. So that means if the bus comes at 7.45, uh, little Jimmy would probably have to wake up around seven and to get that 10 hours of sleep, you'd have to go to bed at nine. So that wouldn't change the current um, sleep schedule too much. Uh, and again, kindergartners would have to go to bed a little bit earlier than that, probably closer to eight, okay? <clears throat> if we scooted the school start time closer to 8.15, um, that means that the bus would probably have to come around 7.30, between 7.15 and 7.45, I'm estimating, and again, this is just an estimate based on, on um, what I have in my head. Um, I didn't actually get this from Barrington. So that means that wake up time would have to be closer to 6.45. Uh, bedtime would be closer to 8.45. And again, the kindergartners would have to wake up, or go to bed a little bit earlier than that, probably closer to 7.45. So think about your own household. If you have an elementary school child, this is kind of how and these are just rough estimates. You would have to figure out um, how this would fit into your family, but um, these are just rough estimates. If school start time was at eight, bus would on average be there at 7.15, wake up time would have to be closer to 6.30, and bedtime would be closer to 8.30 to get that 10 hours of sleep that they would need in elementary school. And the kindergartners would probably have to go to bed probably closer to 7.30 is probably what I was estimating. So, there are a few things to consider, right? One, if we're shifting the sleep times too early, especially for the younger kids, the element, or sorry, the kindergartners, we might be um, cutting into family time, uh, especially for families that have a dual income. So mom and dad are both working. The other thing is, is yes, younger children can fall asleep earlier than the older children. We know that. They, I mean, you probably see this in your old house. They, they can fall asleep earlier. Um, however, there is data from Dr. Le Bourgeois, who is at the University of Colorado, Boulder, showing that even younger kids can have some trouble falling asleep. And <clears throat> so forcing sleep, having a parent at bedtime too early, can actually lead to problems like bedtime resistance. So um, this slide is from Dr. Le Bourgeois. She, um, she shows that about 58% of five-year-olds have bedtime sleep problems. So almost 60%, so that's a lot. So we just have to think carefully about how early we can put these little kids to bed as well. Um, we don't want them to go to bed so early that they're coming out of their beds um, and, having, and having this bedtime resistance. So my recommendation would be to start schools, to start the elementary schools as close to 8.30 as possible because that's consistent with the current recommendations. The current recommendations are really for middle school and high school, uh, but since we don't have a lot of data, I would say probably 8.30, 8.15 to 8.30 might be the best, um, the best approach. And that will likely lead to the least amount of disruption to even family time and sleep routine in younger children. Um, so if you can get it closer to 8.30, whether it's you know, something like 8.15, that might be a better approach. 
So I will leave it there for questions. Hopefully I didn't take too much time. Um, if anybody has questions, I'm happy to try and answer them. That would be great. We're going to have a microphone so that if there's some questions. Um, just to thank Dr. Carlin for being here tonight. I didn't have an opportunity to do that. I was sitting in my seat thinking, and I didn't even thank all of you for coming out tonight. So thank you for joining us this evening and listening to the information. Um, and I also didn't present an agenda. So we will be talking um, and presenting some information about the work that we've been doing as a committee. So for now, if you have questions specific to sleep and sleep needs, then Dr. Crowley would be a good person for you to ask. And if there are questions that you have in regards to the information that you may have seen already and also the work that we've been doing as an input 220, please hold on to your questions and we can address those perhaps um, as we have that informal kind of um, meet and greet. And or you can also share your, your viewpoints during the public comment. So if you could come up to the microphone. Yeah. On your earlier slide, I don't know if you can go back, where you were showing the uh, difference in time that it takes for different ages to fall asleep. This is much earlier. And you were pre-pubescent and pre-pubescent. Oh, very good. Okay. Yes. If I understand correctly, in the box right there, at the very far top, left, that shows that, if I understand correctly, pre-pubertal pre and post-pubertal fall asleep roughly about the same uh, time period at about 10 o'clock. Is that correct? Am I reading that correctly? So this is 10.30 a.m., right? You know, in the box. Oh, here. Right there. I'm sorry. Yep. Okay. So they both will fall asleep, high schoolers and younger kids in about the same time period if they go to bed about 10 o'clock. Is that what this, you're seeing this, on that chart? Yeah, this point is about 8.30 p.m. Okay, so this between, one is 10.30 p.m. So somewhere between 8.30 and 10.30, both groups will fall asleep about the same time, as far as we know from the data. As far as we don't have any points between here and here. Yes. Okay. Thank you. That was the last time it was done. Alan Pack, um, University of Pennsylvania. Wow, someone needs to repeat that. You're right, especially in teenagers. <laughs> well, you've done a, the research that you've shown, some of the studies that you and others have done, at least what your focal point is, is what's happening at night before bed. You talked a very little bit, the crashes was one example of the morning time. So what's happening, and you show 45 minutes of waking up and getting ready at home, 45 minutes on the bus. What's going on? And then, of course, they get to school and they're spending time in school learning. That's what this is all supposed to be about, learning. So what's happening in the morning from pre-wake up time, wake up time, starting to school, second period, first period? Well, what's the research about that or what we talk about? In terms of uh, what they're actually doing or their sleep patterns or? So the study of sleep right. includes pre-sleep, what time they should go to bed. What's happening an hour before me, giving us things to do. It, it, it should include, or it, to me, it, it has to, it does include post sleep. Mm -hmm. So, what's happening as you're waking up, and what's happening as you're still waking up, but you're awake? Especially if kids are getting up early. You know, history, That's current a state question. is, current state is they're getting up too early right. for what they should be doing. So, their bodies aren't many. So, what, what, talk to me about the science around sure. that. So there's actually a, a very, um, I'll call it a seminal study because um, it really, sh it really did show us what was happening at the beginning of the school day. So Dr. Karskadnik Brown, um, she followed. This was um, I think maybe late '90s. She followed ninth graders um, through the tenth 
to 10th grade. Ninth grade, they were starting at about 8.30. and 10th grade, they were starting at about 7.30. So they had a 60 minute um, shift earlier in their school start times. And what she found was from the ninth grade to the 10th grade, if you gave her, if you gave the students this multiple sleep latency test, it's how fast are they falling asleep um, in, in the morning, so during normal school hours, that they were falling asleep within five minutes. And they were also showing REM sleep onset during these naps in the morning. So what does that mean? That actually is an indication of narcolepsy. Now, there wasn't an outbreak of narcolepsy in Rhode Island in 1995. Um, but that's an indication of, first, that they're very sleep deprived, but also second, REM sleep usually has, happens in the end of your sleep pattern. So you have a lot more REM sleep at the end of the night, a lot of non-REM sleep at the beginning of the night. So at about 8.30 in the morning, when they're taking these tests and they're measuring their sleep patterns, they're seeing a lot of REM sleep in these first few naps. And so that's a really big indication that their head should not be in school at 8.30 in the morning. Their head should still be on the pillow. So we're seeing, different, uh, we're seeing a different sleep structure in these naps in the morning. Um, so that's probably, one of, in terms of physiology, that's what's happening in the morning. Um, we also know that a large majority of adolescents are waking up with an alarm. Um, majority of adults are also waking up with an alarm. Um, so I hope that answers your question in terms of what's happening in the morning in terms of their alertness and their sleep physiology. Anyway. Yeah, I, I mean, I do have a follow-up. Okay. Yeah, I mean, so the, the follow-up question then is, uh, we're backing in to 8 o'clock, 8.30, we're backing into the numbers that are there based on the, the other charts and graphs that you showed, it would seem that you could come to a scientific, not you get up at seven o'clock and go to bed at nine o'clock, but rather based on the circadian rhythms, et cetera. I mean, it seemed like you know, one of the questions was 10 o'clock. I mean, shouldn't they be going to bed later and getting up later? Shouldn't school start later even still? Like, you know, 10, 11 o'clock? I mean, what's the science tell us? not what we're backing into for school administrative purposes. Well, um, there's not an ideal school start time for every single student. That's the first thing that you have to understand. So I know that there's some um, some talk about you know a zero hour type of thing that you can talk about later. Um, so there's not going to be an ideal school start time for everyone. The current recommendations from the American Academy of Pediatrics is 8.30 based on the average sleep schedule of an older adolescent would be about 11 to 8 to get that nine hours of sleep so but again you have to think there's variability around those averages so some students you know your son or daughter might go to bed at 10 or maybe maybe go to bed at midnight because they're staying up to do homework or um what or just can't fall asleep because they're not tired yet um, so there isn't really a good answer to your question, unfortunately. I think starting with later than 8.30, and again, I do commend Barrington for taking on this issue and thinking 9 and 9.30, because that will incorporate or bring in more kids, especially those night owls that really have a hard time waking up in the morning. That will kind of bring them along, and their brains will be a little bit more ready to learn in the morning. I mean, that's the whole point of school, right? Um, socializing, but also learning. Um, so unfortunately, I don't have a really great answer. This is after 8.30 is the recommendation. Um, I think 9, 9.30 is a good, very good start. Uh, just a quick comment on that. Actually, the Manchester County, in London, or outside London, uh, is uh, starting the school at the pilot study starting the school at high school at 1.30 p.m. and ending at 7 p.m. So the jury's out there to see what the outcome of that study will be. Of course. I'm just saying there's research that supports what the gentleman is asking about. Some right. More research. So I think AAP and uh, CDC had to put some kind of a guideline and they came up at 8.30 or later 
would be minimally disruptive to the community, students, and everything else. Yeah, and I think that that's a really good point. Uh, Russell Foster is the one uh, in Manchester who's doing that pilot study, and I, I can't wait to see the results because I think it's uh, really, really interesting. Um, and we were talking about this at dinner earlier, is one of the things that we have to think about is parents also work. So how do we get your sophomore to school by at 10 o'clock when you've already been at work for two hours? You know, do we know if they got on the bus? Um, or did they actually you know, drive to school? So uh, I think there are definitely logistical issues that you also have to think about. Um, but in terms of the science, um, you know, as I said, 8.30 or later is kind of the current recommendation, later is better. Two questions. One, on any of the slides you showed the school districts that have changed their schedule, what is the latest start time for high school for those school districts? The ones that I showed were 9 o'clock. I mean, I looked one up, it was 8.30. Yeah, there's one, uh, I think it was the Wyoming one? Yeah, just curious. And there's a person from 8.30 to 8.30 to 9, which is most common. It's about 9 o'clock is really the latest that people have gotten. Yeah. Okay. That's a good question. Just thinking about the sports teams, you know, kids who are on sports teams, and wondering about how many communities in Illinois or just around the country um, are kind of getting on this bandwagon of getting a later start, thinking, you know, to have more of a reason for us to, to make that change if more communities are themselves making the change. Do, can you speak to that at all? I think more and more communities are getting on board. I don't think fast enough, though. Um, so in Illinois, um, I don't even think there's necessary legislation even to kind of speak to that yet. Um, in other states, there have been there has been legislation. So it, you know, it's really tough at the federal and state level to get any legislation passed for school start times. It really does have to start with the districts um, and. Towns like Barrington and other towns, surrounding towns, that can kind of bring it all together. Um, so it's very slow, very slow in Congress, of course. Um, but it's um, it's very hard to get anything done at the state level. Um, but if more towns, you're right, if more towns do get on board, then issues like sports kind of don't seem like a big issue anymore because everyone's kind of on the same, on the same page. In Minnesota, Actually, one of the first studies done in the Dining, Minnesota, was back in the 90s, where they, they changed their school start times by an hour to, I think, about 9 o'clock, 8.30 or 9. And since then, a number of towns and a number of districts in Minnesota have changed. Um, so they seem to be kind of on the same page um, and way ahead of the game than a lot of other states. My question was just regarding the AAP recommendation. Uh, was that for all children? Correct? No, that's for middle school and high school. Okay, so they don't have recommendation for elementary. Because I notice over there a lot of them switched to 8 a.m. Mm -hmm. And I am concerned about that with the elementary school, just as you kind of pointed out. Mm -hmm. So making that switch may not be the best decision. So I just wanted to know what the guidelines There are no guidelines for elementary school currently, okay. um, just because there's not enough data. So remember, so that question, I already wrote it down. In all of this, as the school I'm trying to understand, there seems to be an assumption that teenagers are going to bed until after 10.30 at night. So my question is, this is a new study where if you have parents exercising parental control mm -hmm. or the teenagers going to bed between 10 and 10.30, how that affects their cognitive ability and ability to wake up for uh, 7.30, 8 o'clock, 8.30, Parents at bedtimes is very important, and I can't emphasize that enough, um, to, for a number of different factors. Getting a, enough sleep, um, and that can kind of lead into other things. So if you get enough sleep, 
you're less depressed or depressed mood, uh, you have fewer depressed symptoms, um, given a, a decreased risk of suicidal ideation, and a number of other things. So parents at bedtimes are very, very important. The issue becomes, um, during adolescence, they're seeking autonomy. You know, when you're at, that's kind of their job, is <laughs> adolescence. We want to kind of become ourselves and um, we don't really want to you know, listen to mom and dad necessarily. Um, but I think parents at bedtimes are important and negotiating that bedtime, especially with older adolescents, is kind of the way to go. So if you can decide on uh, 10, 30, 11, you have to be in bed by 11. You have to be in bed by 10, 30, or 10, whatever it is. Um, again, there are lots of individual differences in how an adolescent a teenager can fall asleep. So one person might be able to fall asleep at 9 o'clock, no problem. And then we have adolescents that I've seen for a number of years showing they cannot fall asleep before midnight. It's really, really, really hard for them to do that. So a parent's at bedtime doesn't really help with that. And again, that, that, that goes back to the physiology, changing physiology. So no study for that. Parents at bedtimes, yes, there are a number of studies. Yes, yes, and that's why I emphasize it. And then the second uh, part of that is if you were to flip it over and you have a large majority in the population of two income households where parents are going to work and have to leave at seven, um, are there any studies that would affect them adolescents being by themselves for several hours and having to get up and get to school at 9.30? Right, there are no studies, as far as I know, there are no studies looking at that. Um, and part of the problem with that research question is there are a lot of different types of households. Um, so you have dual parent households, single parent households, um, and so on. So I don't know of any studies that specifically look at that. <coughs> yes, exactly. Yes, so whether you're worried about your kid in the morning before you go to work, whether you're working with your kid at 2 o'clock in the afternoon when they're getting home to school. So please join me in thanking Dr. Crowley for joining us tonight. We can see you switch over her computer to our computer. Um, so maybe I'll just take this opportunity to apologize publicly to the person I cut off in the very tiny school parking lot today. <laughs> I'm so sorry. <laughs> Clearly I had a lot on my mind today about tonight. Um, and I don't know who you were, but you were not happy, I know that. <laughs> yeah, I know. This is a public friend. Yeah. All, now that that's off my chest, it should see why we are all here um, and the impact. Um, of sleep on our kids and our community. Um, of course, I also, while we're doing this change, I also want to take this opportunity on behalf of Paul Chidi, who is also the coach and myself, just to thank this committee who has done outstanding work and a diligent effort over the past uh, nine months or so, maybe it was more, I can't remember. Uh, to be perfectly honest, it's been kind of, a, uh, of um, an intensive, and uh, interesting, and I think that my own sleep hygiene has gotten better because of it. So again, the public service announcement and how important sleep is. But uh, this has been a group who I think has represented the community well, and you can see the representation of our membership. In addition to the fact that they have been committed, dedicated, strongly opinionated, which is good because out of discourse, as I told Dr. Harris, out of discourse comes good things. So while we respectfully may disagree with each other, I think that we have come to a place, um, and I look forward to the opportunity after Paul um, presents some information to talk a little bit more in detail to you all. And that full time. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Jen. And again, thank you to our community members. It's, uh, it's been great for six months. Okay, we're going to start talking about options, uh, but we thought maybe we'd just roll through a couple of slides, provide a little context, provide a little background, and then uh, Jennifer will kind of walk through the different options that we're currently looking at. Again, thank you to our committee. Um, the amazing cross-reference of talent that came together, too. Um, you've heard from our medical group, uh, Dr. June Lee, Mitten, 
Dr. Gray, who spoke earlier. Um, in addition to that, we also have a great group of parents who brought professional, legal, finance, logistical background to our group. Um, I know I'm proud to be part of the group. As a committee, or as a community, I'd be proud of the work that this group did. As I say all the time, if I was in the audience, I'd want to hear, I'd want a cross-functional group who really worked hard to come up with some answers. And I'm proud to say that we have that in This is kind of our charge, our charter, what we were asked to do. As you read it, two words have resonated with our group at the very beginning. Should there be change? And could there be change? That's what we were challenged to answer for ourselves as we continue to work forward. Should there be change? We heard uh, tonight from Dr. Crowley. It was a group going back to the very beginning. We looked at mountains of medical information. We spoke with medical professionals. We had our team present to us. We heard again tonight. Sleep is better. Our kids would benefit from it. And if change could happen, it should happen. The question is, can it? So what are some of the challenges that we face living in our community? Many of us have lived here for several years. These are not going to be a surprise. One or a single unit. Just to uh, compare that to Stevenson or Barrington, the kindergarten, uh, elementary schools, middle schools, and high school all aren't part of the same district. We are. We've got to take that into account. So any change impacts everything. 72 square miles. If you have a child in extracurricular, you know that it's 72 miles. <laughs> um, you'll see there kind of how our schools are broken up, um, spread out, but it is a full 72 miles. Multi-tier bus system, you're going to hear multi-tier. Once going to one level is a tier, going to middle school is a tier, going to high school is a tier. We currently run a three-tier system. We're going to talk about options that kind of flatten that to two. How can that be done and what are the impacts of that? Without a doubt, busing and the logistics of our community is one of the biggest challenges we have. Other things that we want to consider, take into account, absolutely um, get a wide range of input around it. The con contracts that we have here, financial impact, what would it cost, what the logistics, what if we dumped everybody in the town, in the city at, at 8.30 in the morning, what would that do? Um, instructional constraints, okay? If you start at a particular time, how is that going to impact school? We don't want to end up back going backwards in any want to go forward. So it's, it's a challenge with error. So what have we been doing? As you heard, starting this group going back to last June, uh, May, June, we've, been, we've had over 40 meetings, formal and informal, with our committee and with uh, constituents and stakeholders around the community. Um, massive research on sleep, overwhelming, uh, supporting what we, what we were doing. Benchmark, 70% or 70 uh, school, uh, school districts were benchmarked. A benchmarking committee who spoke at our last open forum went into great detail. They talked to those uh, school districts, they talked about the challenges, they talked about what they were able to overcome and what happened after the change. They presented that, and all that information is on the website, and to our committee we commend them. That was tremendous work. We didn't have to plow new ground. Um, numerous conversations with the bus company. Um, they've been a partner with us from the very beginning. This could not have been done. We couldn't have looked at the options or what's possible without them being involved. Uh, impact. The impact on extracurricular sports was uh, up front and center from the very beginning. Nothing was going to happen without all of those constituents at the table providing input. Um, this is our second session. We hosted another one on November 12th where we went through a number of topics including logistics and uh, um, other benchmarking uh, schools. 
We also wanted to share with everybody what our charge was then. So that evening of the last meeting, we put out a uh, community-wide survey. Um, we went for about two weeks. Then as a committee, we spent significant time reviewing that. What was the community saying to us? Um, you saw we had 40 meetings. There's maybe 100 people here. It would be impossible for us to hold meetings and talk to the community one-on-one. -on -one. We had to do a survey. And Jennifer's going to come up now and kind of share some of those results. I can tell you, supporting us and supporting you tonight is a survey of 5,000 respondents providing input on what they think we should do. Students, teachers, parents. Okay, so as Paul said, um, the survey results, and this is going to be similar to, if you have been following this closely virtually, because it has been in, in, um, available online, this might be repetitive, so I apologize, but for those of you who have, who have not had the opportunity to see the presentation that we made to the board in December, at December the December meeting, um, this will be new to you. So again, if you've seen it before, I apologize, but this is an overview of the information that we learned from the survey. So I, um, as I said to the board, in another role, I am familiar with research and I have been told when you put a survey out, a response rate of 25% is a good response rate. So if you can see here, you can note that we had a really good response rate to our surveys. Um, and we are very comfortable with the information that, that we um, received from the community in regards to feeling like it was a, a good representation of the community in terms of um, the, the response rate. So one of the questions that was coming up, and I think I might have um, gleaned kind of a theme that was coming up about what will the students do in the morning, because it, if you've been following the subject, as we have, you may have seen some comments on the internet and other places in terms of students will just get to be on Facebook or on Facebook, as Dr. Kelly pointed out, <laughs> but um, you know, on Snapchat or Instagram or wherever else it is. So we just wanted to include, I don't know if you had the opportunity to see the surveys that your children completed, but we wanted to ask the students, what would you do with extra time in the morning? And we did, and you can see that overwhelmingly, 81%, 90, one, I'm sorry, 88% or 99%, so 88% of the middle school, 91% of the high school, students said that they would in fact sleep. So to us as a committee, that was fairly compelling. And um, I think you can see that, yes, if they're not sleeping, there is distribution amongst other areas, but perhaps homework would be another second place point. So now I'm going to go through some information that is um, talking about start time specifically. And um, one of the key takeaways, and I'm going to steal the lingo from the research books <laughs> because it, I think it captures it well. The key here is, is to look at the convergence of color. So you can see when you look at the data, the line is the current start time, 9 a.m. And you can see the feedback of the parents with elementary school children who was in blue, and then the curve of the elementary school employees. So in case you didn't know this, that we did, we did actually survey not only parents and children of 220, but then also employees of 220. So that's the feedback that we got um, in regards to the elementary school population. Then again, it, convergence of color. If you look at middle school parents, middle school students, and middle school employees, they all kind of come together around that 8.30 time, similarly to the previous slide that you saw, even though currently middle school is starting at 8 a.m. Um, we incorporated parents with middle school children as well as high school children because it's an adolescent school sleep need. I think initially when some of us came to the committee and started having conversations with our community, you know, friends and brought information. There was a perception that this is just a high school issue, but as we saw from the information that Dr. Crowley presented, and if you have been reading the information that's been out there, it's more of an adolescent issue. So we felt that yes, it has an impact on the middle school as well. And therefore, we asked questions of the parents with middle school children about the habits that the middle school children were keeping, etc. 
And then again, I'm coming back to that same term, sorry to be a broken record, but the convergence of color <coughs> tends to come with this, and this is the feedback from the high school groups, the high school students, the parents, as well as the high school employees. But you can see that a good portion of the response comes to right about that 8.30 point. Um, even though school is starting at 7.20, as you can see by the black line. Again, um, we had some difficult tasks to consider as we think about the fact that the, the Paul already had made a comment about the three-tier bus system, but then also the 72 square miles. And I know there was a comment previously or a question about other schools and the impact in terms of sports and what they've been doing. And what we have heard through the grapevine is that many school districts are sitting and waiting to, do, to see what we do because of the unique challenges that our school district has because we are a unit school district using um, with unique geographical challenges. So to get to the meat of why we are all here, you will see right now three options that we are currently considering. And if you look at, or if you've been following, again, the, mini, the meeting minutes, you might note that we have started with nine options. So, the key takeaway I would like for you all to know is that we did hear the community. We heard you and we heard everybody say that they want to start at 8.30. So that was in fact an option that we have considered and we have discussed um, quite in quite a lot of detail. Um, and at this point, it did not, for multiple reasons, it did not receive enough support to be able to move forward to this position. So I wanted to just proactively address that question or that issue, but I am not going to address questions right now, but um, thank you for having one. And we'll, we'll, we'll address it in just a moment. Other questions? I believe we have information that's out there, but right, what we can do is have one-on-one -on -one conversations with um, members of the committee. Because again, this is very, we are very intimate with this information because we've been talking about it for quite some time. So if we want to have some one-on-one -on -one questions or information, we'd be happy to talk to you about that. For now though, for the larger group, um, let's just talk about the three possibilities or current scenarios that we have on the table. Now I want to also just preface this by saying we are meeting again. I believe there's a rumor out there that the decision is made and it's a done deal and that's it. That's not the case, and so what I would like for everybody to understand is that yes, in fact, we have more meetings. These are potential scenarios that are out there and that we are considering currently. We had, we come from nine scenarios and then we've come down to now currently three. Um, and but the, the diligence is still there and we are working to try and find the best option for our community and for the health of our children and our community. So, Let's just take a quick look at what's currently out there, and then we will open up to public comment. When I say currently out there, I mean in terms of possible scenarios. So what you'll note by looking at the scenarios is that the, um, we are proposing, or there's been a proposal, to move the pre-K to, um, to fifth grade, meaning the elementary schools, to nine o'clock. And then the middle schools, I'm sorry, I'm so sorry. Current. This is the current. <laughs> and this is, I don't need to go through this detail with you because you're living it, right? Okay. So here is scenario one. You can see across, if you've had an opportunity to take a look at what we are proposing to in terms of the possible scenarios, um, there's pretty much consistency amongst the elementary schools and, among, and um, with the middle schools. So we are looking at um, a start time of 8 a.m. for the elementary schools and a start time of the of 8.50 for the middle schools. Um, and then the three scenarios have different timing for the high schools. One is at 9 a.m. And you can see the associated implications in terms of transportation, but please be assured in knowing that there are many other issues that we have been considering beyond simply transportation and money. I know that we did hear you all um, at the public forum and we've been listening to you through the internet. So we know that this is, um, these two are hot topics for people and we wanted to address those, but we are considering a multitude of issues. The second scenario is not, again, elementary at eight, 
middle school at 850, and then the high school at 915. And you can see the associated implications in terms of busing and cost related to that scenario. And then finally, the third scenario is the start time of eight again for elementary, middle school is at 8.50, and high school at 9.30. One of the things that we've learned um, from our public, I mean from the public input, that, um, we are very sensitive to not only start times, but then also end times, because we know that there is interest in terms of sports and other activities outside of school that people will want to engage in, um, that they want their children involved in. So we, as a group, talked and kind of set some ground rules uh, in terms of the scenarios that we were considering. And we did, as we did that in the front end in terms of transportation time for the children and when, what would be an earliest time for an elementary school child to be out at a bus stop, we also considered on the back end in terms of what would be the latest time that, we would, that would be acceptable to us as a group for when the schools would, would release. So before I end my comments here, um, unanimously or overwhelmingly, I guess I would say, we heard from the districts who have done this previously. We did do, I, I will commend the, the committee on the due diligence that we did in finding other school districts who have done something like this. And pretty um, consistently across the board, what we heard was change is difficult and there, it's going to be hard for your community, um, for any community. Everybody who's been through it had a difficult time with it. And so we agree, we understand, we are sympathetic to the fact that change is difficult. Um, but also, again, as we look towards this possibility of changing, ultimately what we're looking at is the health of our children and the health of our committee. While I thought I knew quite a bit of information about the importance of sleep, I didn't realize the impact it would have on car accidents. I didn't realize the impact it would have on other performance issues in terms of children, and also depression, and alcohol, and drug use, and other things like that. The impact that it has on so many things in terms of the health and well-being of our community. And I will put out there that I know it's someone in some ways, in some of your minds, who may not have been as intimate with this data, it might be a bit of a leap of faith to take this journey, but I will also ask that you trust that we have done a lot of homework on this. We have slept, <laughs> eat, drink, sleep, sleep, um, if you can imagine. But we certainly have put a lot of time and energy to make sure that what we came to you today to present as possible scenarios um, would be things that would be would take into account all of the information that we have learned from other districts that have done it and in terms of um, implementation, but then also the research and the scientific data that we're seeing that supports giving our kids more sleep. So, on that note, I will open it up to public comment. No need to raise your hands. Um, I'll invite you up to the mic if you would. We will um, incur, you know, we would ask because there are a lot of people here if you might. Try and keep your public comments to about two minutes or less, if you could. If you have questions that are specific that you want to engage in a dialogue, I recommend, or I will also request that you actually approach one of us from the committee um, so that we can talk to you about your question and give you a little bit more information that perhaps time would allow within that two minute allotment. So, on that note. I just first of all want to say thank you for all of your work. And as a parent of a high school, middle school, and elementary school at the same time, I will definitely say that this is going to be a wonderful change for the high schoolers. As a parent who gets up at 5.45 to give nutrition to my student who has a very hard time getting up and is a very good student, it's very difficult to get up at 5.45, 6 to get to the high school and be a good student. But my one concern with all of those um, scenarios is the 8 a.m. start time for the elementary school. Having an elementary school, being a working parent, I noticed that they, we will not be able to get a babysitter within the school district to watch them after school. So could you maybe as a group think about having after school care at each individual elementary school as an option for parents? Because we won't be able to use those older children, they will be coming home first off the bus. And so that's one of my major concerns. I am. I think it's a wonderful idea to change this for the high schoolers and the adolescents. 
but I am concerned about that early start time and early coming home time for the elementary school. I can't imagine how much time you all have put into this and the late comer to this whole process. And mostly my concern about adjusting the start times, and I think we all recognize the kids need more sleep, but I don't understand how we reduce their instructional time every day by an hour and how we still accomplish a high quality of instructional education. I'm afraid we're going to end up with kids with tons of homework and then we're going to defeat that whole purpose of giving them more sleep because they'll stay up to do it. My question goes along with that. Along with reducing the instructional time, I will do some of the program documents and the minutes that you would put out, and it looks like you were proposing a seven period high school day and cutting out the period. So I have a question for you regarding that and the impact that that will have on our students, especially since AP classes are two periods long. Are you cutting out the lunch? Are you cutting out the eight? Do the kids sit to the eight straight? Will they have that opportunity? So you would only offer very limited options at zero hour. At what time would that start? Um, I just want to echo the previous comments and, and say thank you for all the work that you put into this. I know it's been a very painstaking process and you, you all um, I want to echo the concerns, though, about instructional time. It looks like the high school day is reduced by seven minutes. Um, there's well-presented information about bus costs and additional buses. I'm not seeing the information about where, where that additional seven minutes, you know, what, what that's taken. Um, and I think that's a major concern. I think uh, it's a major concern for me. I think it's a major concern for others. Um, and I don't feel that that has been adequate adequately explained. Um, I have a, a student who will be entering the high school next year and then another one two years later. Um, academics are our most important thing, uh, very much a priority for us. Um, that's a major concern. Thank you. <laughs> but um, first, thank you. I know it's on kind of time. Thank you for doing that. Um, again, obviously I have a huge issue with the shortened day. Um, for instructional time. Um, I also, and this may be to the school district, to Jeff and everyone, um, and to Dr. Harris, I, I, everyone wanted 8.30, middle school, high school, grade school. Okay, now, realistically, no one's getting that. And I would like, perhaps, if we could do a survey back to everyone and say, all right, this is realistically what you're gonna get. Can you, do you want this, or do you want it to stay? Because it's, it's not really, I mean, people said it, it's important to sleep, but they're now when they really see these are your numbers and what they have to do to change their lives, you know, is this still what people want? And I, I think it's very important to go back to the community before a decision is made. Hi, I have a similar question. It seems like repetitive. I'm a high school student, middle school. But briefly looking at uh, in the back with the high school day structured class look like it. I wish you looked at that and how would you re regain the minutes lost in the high school class periods? So you're taking one or two minutes away, maybe one or two minutes away from passing periods. How would you regain that for structural time? That's my question, just briefly looking at it. I heard a lot about this, but not as much about that. Thank you also for all your time and can imagine how much time you put in. I do want to make a comment again about the structural time. It's quite obvious by any of those late start times that one class period is going to have to drop. And if we are uh, competitive students trying to do top schools, so you have to look at the application process for those colleges, and you have all your core curriculum classes. And when you backtrack that out into the high school schedule, which I have done for my student, and if you cut out a class period, what is going to and what happens to happen is those students are lining up to drop fine arts and they're going to have to drop um, any other interests that they have. And they're going to spend their school day all in their AP or their honors classes or their core curriculum, whatever level you're at, and they will not be able to enjoy or expand their horizons in high school. And you're going to decimate the orchestra program, the band program, 
and how it could impact on scholastics. And I think parents who are not in high school yet, do not have those kids, and have not thought through that process, need to understand that that is what's coming if this occurs where we have a shortened school day. Thank you. I'm similar on the uh, reiterating on the instructional time. My concern is I did the survey was, well, in the survey deck, she did not give an option to keep an instructional time the same as it is now, which I thought was a little misleading. Um, but instructional time is a huge part when we're taxpayers. It's academic part of why people move here is because of the reputation of every 10 through 20. Um, we've seen that when we get into reduction in their taxes since our kids are getting that lower <laughs> instructional time. Um, and then two, my, my daughter is also in sports in the school. And I read somewhere in one of the numerous emails that was sent out that sports can be done with clubs before school, which sort of is a little counterintuitive to the sleep study because they're still somewhere getting all that time in with doing their academics and their sports, unless again, you're reducing the instructional time, which I don't think a lot of parents are going to be happy with. Uh, reducing the time between class periods Stevenson High School did that, which I thought was interesting, and if it's doable, sure, because that's more efficient, go for it. Arrington, however, I think it's only at six minutes, and if you're reducing it to five minutes, it's a little tight. Um, kids can do it, great, that saves, you know, not a whole lot of time during the day. What is your name? I'll start by thanking the parents who submitted the survey, and the students, too, and that 45% rate was great. And sure, Benny's doing work, but it's our work too. And I think there's still more work to be done. Uh, a, a question, I think I need a response on it though. Uh, Jennifer, is it you, Paul, is it you? Who should, who's the best person to talk with about the eight o'clock elementary school time to learn more? Because I need to be better informed about it. Um, who's, who, who's the best person to talk with? I think any one of our committees a lot of people listed up there. I know, but I'm looking at all these lovely pages, but I see them recently. There's a, okay. there's a good portion. Anybody who has a white um, name tag okay. is, a, is a person who might want to have one Because it seems crazy, literally insane. It does seem insane to have an 8 o'clock start time for a kindergarten student. Last year, hey, great, we're putting them in school all day. They're going to sleep half the day in school now, so they're starting at 8 a.m. The, 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 the science shows us that kindergartner needs to be asleep at 8 o'clock in the morning. That's what the science shows us. And now they're going to be in school then for a long time. Never mind the kindergartner, the first grader, the second grader, they need to be asleep at 8 o'clock, perhaps. Some of them will be, though. So, yes, there are some benefits that are going to come from this, certainly at the high school and middle school levels, it would seem. But there's some detriments that come to it as well. We're going to see increased tardiness. I mean, these are things that weren't touted out by the scientists. She didn't focus her talking points on them. We're going to see uh, lack of good work, lack of positive work by those students early in the morning. And, and this is where I need to be better educated on, I'm wrong about that. Because it sure doesn't seem so from what I heard tonight. And logic doesn't prove that. And I don't think I'm the only one. Uh, I'm a junior at Bridgeton High School, and I think I can speak for a majority of students in that it's a major concern for people to have the start or the end time pushed back later than it already is because of the activities and extracurriculars <coughs> that um, honestly are very important for a college application, in which high school is much prepared for. And um, I already get, with my hand load of AP classes I'm taking, I already am faced with later uh, sleep times than the data from 2005 and 2006 would like indicate. Uh, I don't, just to be honest, I don't think it's very accurate anymore um, to, for students who going to sleep around 10. I go to sleep 11, midnight, one if I have a lot of homework or a test. Um, and I just think it's uh, a concern that I think it should be voiced um, because most people here are parents and I just don't know if it's noticed as much. Um, but uh, I just am worried if we go too far back 
that students will have to make a decision that negatively affects their application into uh, college. And I know Barrington is a town in which a lot of uh, we're like blessed to have such good education, but um, college application isn't just GPA, isn't just um, transcripts. It's also extracurriculars and essays, and I just don't know if that's being calculated. And I hope. thank the committee for your time. I'm sure there's really no easy answer to all of this, I think that we all know. And some of this might be a little redundant, but I still want to say it anyway. Um, what will happen when we compete against other schools when we have a different time? Um, you know, how much later now uh, we have to wait, or you know, other schools have to wait, or now they're not going to want to wait for us to finish our academic day uh, to get there. Sometimes there's some schools that are really far away against them, they're not in our conference, or even in our conference when they're far. Um, another concern is, um, will coaches start holding practices before school? Um, there are many sports that do, um, that I know of. Um, there's even um, football, wrestling, swimming, and I'm sure there's many other sports that um, practice before school, and that's super early now. Is it gonna become the norm that there's now more practice before school? Uh, will coaches be allowed to do that? Because again, as somebody else mentioned, it kind of defeats the whole purpose of getting sleep. And then you have these athletes who are doing all this additional schoolwork and exerting themselves and now even getting less sleep because they've had to wake up maybe even earlier. And um, the instructional time, in addition to, of course, it being instructional and that's very important, my comment then was the social emotional part of it too where you don't get a chance to talk to your friends during the middle of the day. My son carries everything with him in his backpack because where his locker is located, he can't make it there and get to his class at the same time. So if he can't do that now in the amount of time, then what about the other kids? And I think it is important for the kids to get a chance to, to talk in school. You need that wait time. And you need time, there's been studies too about, like button chair. You need to get up during class time and move around and things like that, so thank you. I mean, I'm sure this is obviously not the last meeting ever of all of this, and it seems like it should just be the tip of the iceberg because this, and this is that, and that's huge. And that, to me, is a bombshell. And I think when a lot of parents see this instructional time, the crap's gonna hit the fan, quite honestly. So my hope is that in the process of discussing this, there must be many more meetings about this, like that they need to go up there. So hopefully there's more meetings that you have planned with the community to discuss that and what that's gonna look like. And there might even be more iterations of this. For all I know, this could just be like one thing that you put out there for today and hopefully there's more information coming to the community about instructional time and that before you know, a decision is made. So I just want to make sure that's going to happen. Oh, I'm Jordan. Um, hi, I'm also a junior in high school. Um, and I, when I was looking at these um, the possible scenarios, I was just curious why we couldn't switch scenario three and have the high school start at eight and the um, pre-K through five, grade five start at 9.30. I mean, I don't know a lot of too many facts about it, but I just think it's that in that consideration. Um, then our end time would be much similar to now because I know, okay, so I'm in um, a sport in the fall and I'm involved in the musical and those practices and rehearsals are typically three hours. So let's say we're ending at the 3.48 time or even the 3.30 time at the high school. You're gonna start rehearsal or practice at four o'clock. So three hours later, you're ending at seven. Then, you know, you get home, you eat dinner, that takes about, you, you you know, shower, the, the whole dinner, get home, shower, takes two hours. So now you're at nine o'clock. That's when you're starting your homework. Then if you're in, you know, I'm, I'm currently enrolled in four AP classes, that takes me two to three hours of, well, one to three hours of homework a night. So on a low homework night, I'm ending at 10 o'clock, like at the earliest. And on a typical night, I'll be ending that at midnight. And I just think that switching scenario three would be really ideal <laughs> for students. Hi, I'm a nurse, and my family will do whatever you do with the schedule, but my opinion and my experience as a nurse, whether you are 
patients, families, kids of all different ages. I do think that it is a mistake to do this too quickly because I think there's a lot of extraneous variables to some of this research that I could sit there and nitpick at. I'm also concerned because in my experience, whether it was with different families in other districts or elsewhere, I found that a lot of the kids that were falling asleep during school were the kids that were up all night on their cell phones, and they have electronics in their room, TVs in their room, computers in their room, things like that. And it's like a core of what we call sleep hygiene effect in the medical field. So, you know, I'm just a little concerned about that and this idea of decreasing the instructional time in the course is a huge mistake. And I do see in other districts that when the kids have a late start because of their blessing system on certain days of the week, those kids are just staying up later the night before, going out with their friends and doing the packets. Um, I, I just, hopefully this will be addressed at, at some point. Um, curious to know, it looks like some of the scenarios for year two with the high school schedule would involve a lot of scheduling, um, which seems like a major change. And, and the question is whether that change, you know, whether the only input into that change would be this change in schedule or if there are some other factors involving that. It's, it's really not clear. My second question, and I apologize if this was addressed earlier, is just what the, the what the process is and how quickly um, your group will be recommending a change to the school board. Um, it does think, seem like things are, I'm sure you feel like you've been living with it for a very long time and you have. Um, this is all new information to, to people who have not been part of the group. What, what is the time timeline at this point? Thank you. Thank you guys for working on this for so long. I know that we're all trying to catch up because you in it for a year and we're still learning it and have so many questions that you already had answered. But I guess, you know, everything that everyone has said, I agree with. But the one thing for me, I guess, is I don't get bus services for my elementary and my middle school. And for next year, I will get a bus for my high school, but I'm worried about for the zero hour. Does that mean I will have three times I'm in the car trying to get my kids for an 8 o'clock, for an 8.30, and for like an 8.30 zero hour? which seems very difficult for me, and then to go to work. Um, so I guess just logistically for thinking of parents who are working and also trying to make their, um, help their kids get as much instructional time as possible to be in band, um, and how we get them all there when we don't have the Thank you. I just got a little um, verbal oh. reminder from somebody, but I didn't hear what it said. Okay. The zero hour bus again, you said. All right, so um, a couple of things have come up, and while I said we weren't necessarily going to address all the public comments one on one, I mean, as a group, but there are some things that have been said that I would be remiss to not um, make a public comment myself about. And that would be one. We did talk about the possibility of what happens when you make more space in the morning. Did somebody just come along and fill it? Does that actually address the issue of sleep needs for our kids? And that, so that is certainly something that we've talked about, and we feel strongly that that would not be the, that we would recommend that that would not be the case. Um, I also heard a question about our timeline. We have two more meetings, and we'll be meeting over the next two weeks. And our plan is to put forth a proposal to the school board in uh, February, I believe it's February 16th. At the February 16th meeting, we will put forth our proposal. And as Paul walked you through our charge, our charter, we have been charged with um, putting forth three proposals that we see as um, viable, viable proposals. So um, I'm, I'm hearing some information about that survey results and the 8.30, everybody wants to start at 8.30. And transportation does certainly come into play in this piece. And we have been working closely, as Paul also noted, the partnership with the transportation company. Um, and there is, um, you know, it's down to the minute, quite frankly, in terms of optimal busing for everyone, or optimal timing for busing, so that the timing, they're all interrelated, um, as you might glean from looking at the boards and also from the presentation. 
in terms of the zero hour and specific questions about what's presented in the back of the room for those of you who are joining us virtually and don't know when you're seeing us pointing to different things what we're talking about um, there are uh, those specific questions that you have I personally and I don't know that we on the committee can necessarily address them they are best directed to talk to and that's why there are a number of representatives from the high school who can you can talk to one-on-one -on -one about any specific questions you have and feedback you have in terms of your concerns we are not losing any Yes, we're not losing a period either. I think there might be um, a misperception or of some of the information that's been presented. We are not losing an hour. And we've talked about a zero hour. If you're seeing periods one through seven, what you also might be looking, what you might want to look at is the, what's going on at the beginning of the day because we've also considered um, information regarding a zero hour period where if first period started at 9.30, there's a potential for possibly a zero hour 8.30 start time where um, it's a much more complex topic than what necessarily I could go into right now. And these are eight period days. Eight period days. That are point that, as I point over here, these three options are eight period days. So I think I may have addressed some of the issues that came up. There's more people lined up for public comment, so I'll um, Kind of back in reference to the whole, I know several people have commented about 57 minutes being cut from the day. I'm not going to get all crazy about that. I think my question would be, how does that really compare in total number of minutes that we have for instruction as compared to what's the norm in many other schools? And I don't know, are we doing more than what other schools are doing as far as instructional time? Or will we be more in line with what other schools are doing with instructional time by shifting it? I don't know. That would just be my question. Uh, I have a question basically. So the zero if it is for extra activity like band, so today I have to pick up my son after the band class, and if I don't pick up, by the time he reaches home, even the school is done by four, by the time he reaches home is like five forty five. So if the same thing happens, if we have to take a school bus to get to the zero hour, so we won't be cutting anything on the school. Um, coming in late to this whole thing, I took a survey and did everything. Um, I think <coughs> what you're hearing from the majority of the people here, we all agree that these kids need more sleep. We all need more sleep. Um, what I think we're all very surprised at is that, and you're talking about, oh, you're having two more meetings. For what? I mean, we don't have an opportunity in two meetings to even attempt to figure that out, let alone have input about it. And I don't even know how much of our input matters. I don't know if we have a say. We want that, but we don't want that. So we need to figure a way to get them more sleep and not change that. And I think that is the big concern here right now. And we're all a little bit surprised right now with that is now becoming the addition of the sleep which we came to talk about. So thank you. I, I actually have three points and one of them I think is exactly what she said before me. I guess um, I will say that I totally, totally agree that high school kids start way too early. I have two freshman high school kids who absolutely hate school now. So we used to love school all the way up to eighth grade. We have to get up at 5.30 to get a 6.15 bus and it's too early. I think the high school, and any old school, no one should start before 8 o'clock. So I do agree with school, one school starting at 8, and then you can see accordingly now how are we do it. My only concern, I, my concern is, I don't understand why the school day had to become short to achieve the first goal. If our goal was to start the school, to come to the schools a little bit later, why did we have to shorten it on the back end? Um, I, like so many other folks here, am not happy about a whole hour less of school. And then from your example here, I think you're, you're shortening each class by six minutes. And that I'm not happy about. So why did one have to be dependent on the other? Why couldn't everything just be rolled back a little 
give everyone a little extra sleep in the morning and just roll the, the end of time also. Uh, my second thing is I heard through the grapevine or heard some comments about something called block sessions where there's a proposal that we're changing the whole entire class schedule of where all the kids have only four classes every other day. And I have not seen that presented in anything I've read or seen so far. And all of a sudden, that kind of in the, you know, the grapevine kind of came out this week. Is that also proposed? Is, this, is it also being tied to this? Because as a parent, I would not be in favor of that at all. I do not think your core classes should be taken every other day. I think repetition and, constant and being consistent is key for learning. And these kids need that at all grades. And I don't know if the black session was just for high school, middle school, high school, but that's never, I've never heard a word about it until just right now, you know, just recently this week. And again, is that part of this plan too? Is that also being incorporated with the start time change? So that's a question. And then thirdly, my comment is, I think, in my opinion, that an eight o'clock time start is, is, is fine for any of all three of the schools. Whichever one you choose starts at 8, it is not too early for anyone. I do believe 9 or 9.15 or 9.30 is too late for the high school. My recommendation would be to have an 8 o'clock elementary, have the high school start at 8.50, and have the middle school start a little bit later. The middle school kids who also participate in sports and activities do not participate at the same level as the high school kids. The high school kids have more after school activities than the middle school, even though middle school does have some it would make more sense, or the vice versa. Um, have the, the um, my comment is I think the high school should be the one in the middle. High school should start at 8.50, and then you can flip the other ones back and forth. But I think 9.15, 9.30 is way, way too late for the high school kid. And I think 7.20 is way, way too early. So I agree with what you all are doing. I think this is a great thing to change the start time. I just think 9.15, 9.30 is too late for high school. Well, thank you. I actually have a question that I don't think was addressed. Would somebody please explain um, how a two-tier bus route system works? That I don't know that I can do right now, um, but I would recommend, since it looks like this might be the closing of our public comments, that perhaps you talk to one of us one-on-one -on -one and we can do that. Um, we can talk about that. Um, and uh, a couple of other things that came up while we were talking. Specific to the, what, what's going on in the back and, and some of the references made towards black scheduling, um, we heard from the community in terms of the start times, but we also heard from the community in terms of the end times. And that is something that we're also, we've been hearing through a lot of the public comments as well in terms of um, an end time. So, what we were very sensitive to was not just taking the day and pushing it back, because even as Dr. Crowley talked about, there's extracurriculars, there's activities, there's family time, which is important as well. So we didn't want the school day to push back too far into it. So we did set some parameters, and to be perfectly honest, we went to the high school and said, this is the parameters that we're looking at. Can, you know, is this something that's feasible? And as I mentioned, we talked a little bit about the zero hour. There's also these, you have an opportunity to take a look at the um, information regarding block scheduling. So this is, um, in terms of what our charge was, or our charter was, it, this is a way for the high school to show us how they could work within the parameters that we were um, putting forth in terms of the school day. So specific questions to the block scheduling, would certainly be best addressed by um, our high school folks in back. But if I can address the one other thing about the timeline and what our timeline is, I think I already did, right? Okay. I think we'll take one more public comment and then we'll set it up, we'll break out for one-on-one -on -one questions if you have the members of the group. So I have a daughter that graduated in 2013 and was a junior today. And I did not choose to get involved in this discussion because I thought nothing was gonna happen quickly. Things rarely happen very quickly. So when my daughter came home, I, and, that's, and I thank you for your time, it's just a fact, right? Things don't happen, there's, there's conversations, there's discussions that happen, and that's important. So I called, 
a number of friends before I came here and said, here, are you going? Do you know anything about this? And to a person, they said, oh, I've heard a little bit about it. But no, I can't really tell you much about it. So they were not even truly um, educated on the school start change. So to come here and see that about the instructional time being decreased, and this is not a reflection on your, your ability to communicate. It's a fact that people are very, very busy. And so if they think, all right, I will have a chance to look at that later, or it doesn't affect me. But when my daughter comes home and tells me earlier, this week's school is changing. It's going to start at 9.30, and I'm going to have to go to school until 4 o'clock. And she is a great student. She's in AP classes. She goes to ACT tutoring. She does other tutoring. She plays sports. She plays travel. She plays for the high school. I know how her day is structured. There is no extra time in there that you're going to give her more sleep time. And that's not because I'm pushing her to do it. It's because she knows what she's competing against to get into the school that she wants to go to. And so you can rearrange the day as much as you want. But the truth of the matter is she's going to stay up. She's going to work and work late. Getting up in the morning to do something you might never sleep is not something at Berkeley other high school students is. Right. You're not going to do it, right? You're going to do it at night, so we're going to be done. And I, I just think that despite your best efforts to help people understand what's happening, I don't believe that the community is educated about it. Um, they certainly don't know about the instructional time. And so to quickly move to making a decision about something that will affect a lot of um, students for a long time just seems very short-sighted. All right, so it's sensitive, being sensitive to time. Um, I do welcome everybody who has specific questions that they'd like to talk about with, in, with individuals within the committee. Please do come and talk to us and ask us questions. Um, a couple of things I just wanted to mention in terms of instructional time because it does keep coming up. We, we did get feedback. Again, as I said, the surveys went out to parents, <coughs> students, and employees of 220. And we did hear information about instructional time. So we, some of the issues that um, you are voicing in terms of instructional time, I think that some of the proposed uh, ways to, to work within the parameters are actually addressing those instructional time questions. So again, I would ask that maybe you could talk to a high school representative about that specific question if you want to ask those about questions in terms of benchmarking, um, clinical data, uh, busing, and all of those other things please find one of us. Otherwise, I think that the, the best direction for you would be to go to the back of the room where the high school representatives are. Again, thank you all for coming out. Thank you for sharing your thoughts and your feelings. And we will perhaps see you in February.